uh, and as many uh, great historians and certainly people today have said, we cannot understand where we're going until we've seen where we have been. And so understanding what we've been doing to Lake Champlain over the past, well, millennia, but unfortunately most, um, most severely in the last 400 years since European settlers came here, uh, un understanding the sort of damage we've done to the lake has given us a huge amount of understanding of the types of things we need to repair. And so I see the future as a period of repair, uh, uh, undoing the damage, learning from the mistakes, and also we have more knowledge and technology now. We can detect phosphorus in the sediments. We understand the concept of ecosystem. Uh, we understand that randomly stocking species just because we like them is perhaps not a good idea. We have a history of stocking exotic species that just hasn't worked out very well for us. So there's there's a lot we need to do, and the three speakers um, this afternoon, I think, will help guide us into that future. Um, we're going to begin with we're going to begin with Laurie Fisher. Uh, she's with the Lake Champlain Committee, uh, and she's going to be talking about the various challenges and threats in terms of both chemistry, biology, contaminants, plastics that we have to deal with as we move forward. And one, of course, the, the deeply troublesome threats are the new ones that we're only just beginning to invent, plastics, pharmaceuticals, and the like. Um, she will be followed by, uh, from the International Joint Commission, a, uh, a double team of Pierre-Yves uh, uh, Coe and Michael Elada, who will be talking to us about the water side of Lake Champlain, the watershed, the flood uh, controls, and how we share literally the water of this lake and control it without causing uh, problems in the, in the way that we control it. And then we'll be finishing with Jim McKenna, who comes from the uh, New York Office of Sustainable Tourism, who will be speaking to us about what I understand is a new project uh, on the Adirondack side and understanding how we can enjoy this fantastic resource we have even better. So with that, um, I'll very briefly introduce Laurie. Lake Champlain Basin Program, and take it away. Thank you. Bonjour, mes amis, and I'm Laurie Fisher with the Lake Champlain Committee. Um, my assignment this afternoon is to provide a very quick sketch of Lake Champlain's ecological health as a jumping off point for talking about the future. And I want to touch very quickly on seven factors that influence Lake's current conditions and its future climate change, demographics, nutrient loading, toxics, invasive species, access, and cultural values. Any one of these could commandeer a full conference um, and a day or a week. Um, so this is going to be a whirlwind tour, so fasten your seatbelts. Um, climate change, the first one, is increasingly obvious. Um, there are things that we can do regionally and locally, uh, nationally, internationally, and ind individually, but even if we do everything perfectly here, it's going to take billions of people cooperating in order to make a change here. Our climate is warming. If you're 33 years old or younger, the global average temperatures have been above average during every month of your life, at least through November 2018. In the Northeast, we see those ramifications with spring arriving earlier, summers are growing hotter and longer, and winters are getting warmer, less snowy, and shorter. The average annual temperatures have increased about 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit per decade in our region. Lake Champlain does not ice over as often as it did even 20 years ago. The freeze over that happened last month is now a rare event. This chart um, shows a timeline of when ice on Lake Champlain has closed for the past 200 plus years. The lake used to freeze fairly reliably in January, then that freeze over started later in February, and then in March. We couldn't reliably hold that international hockey game in Lake Champlain today. And so one of the things, um, less ice is going to lead to further warming. And because it allows sunlight to increase warm temperatures earlier in the spring, and then in turn, the lake stratifies earlier, so it sets up that warmer layer of water over a colder, deeper one, that makes a significant change on Lake Champlain. Since monitoring began in 1964, 
Average August surface water temperatures have increased in Lake Champlain by about 6.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a big ecological change. And those higher water temperatures really threaten the lake's capacity to support our native cold and cool water fish species like salmon, trout, walleye, and northern pike. And they, but they favor the warm water species such as bass and the invasives who are much more adaptable. So like white perch, they're more likely to thrive. In order to really address this, um, we need to reduce emissions. Of course, you know, we all know that. There are lots of discussions about that. But we also have to adapt locally um, and adapt our communities for a changing climate. And experts are looking at ways that you do that. And one of the high, one of the things that they, some of the things that they note that make a place more attractive in this age of challenging climate is one, access to fresh water. Well, we certainly have that. Uh, com a commitment to emission reductions. We really need to do that in our own region, in our own communities. Um, but also what's very important is updated and well-maintained infrastructure. And as we talk about some of the other problems, I want you to think about all of these factors. And then integrated emergency management and planning, flood proofing our public buildings and our shoreline areas, access to healthy local foods and parks and trails. Why? Because that helps build resiliency and the presence of strong community institutions. Those are all important factors as we move forward. Oops, sorry. Going the wrong way. We're going backwards in time. So demographics, um, people have lived in this basin um, for over 10,000 years. And so when Europeans came and renamed the Lake Champlain, there were about 9,000 people living here. Today we have around 600,000. How many people are going to be relying on the ecosystem services of the future? We haven't seen a significant influx in population yet, uh, but we could begin to start see climate refugees. And one of the things that we just want to think about with that, and this is just one of many, is that while we're the ninth largest freshwater lake in the US, there's one measure by which we exceed all other large lakes in North America, and that's our drainage basin to lake surface area. There are over 8,000 square miles of land which are feeding this lake, and there are about 17.6 acres of land that's informing every acre of water. That is on a different scale than it is for any of the major waterways in Lake Champlain. So that population base spread over large areas really has an influence. It's not just how many people will live here, but how, how those who do choose to live and commute and behave. So nutrients, the most visible sign, and I apologize, this is an old program. I'm just saying this isn't the new slides, but um, we'll roll with it. Um, nutrients are naturally cycling through the environment over geologic time but human activity has greatly accelerated processes for that. And the most visible form on this on Lake Champlain is cyanobacteria blooms. Eric mentioned them earlier. One of the reasons that we are concerned about them is under certain conditions, they can turn toxic. They're public health threats. They, um, they also have economic and recreational implications. 2015, um, 35 properties along Lake Champlain's Georgia shore were devalued, hitting the grand list by a $1.8 million reduction. You see that, uh, you know, it was earlier noted about just the ramifications. When you get a news alert about that, it has a lot of ramifications, not only for that bay that's been affected, but for all water quality in the region and for our tourist, uh, tourism economy that really relies on it. This, um, this graphic shows the phosphorus loading in the land cover and the implications by that, the, the various types. I'm just going to blitz through it. Wastewater treatment facilities only contribute about 6%. We think we're safe there, except that they're aging. And we have not invested in infrastructure in our region, in our country. 
Um, and more than 10% are beyond their expected lifespan, and another 10% are within a few years of it. Those CSOs uh, that we're seeing coming, flowing into our waters are a direct sign of this. We're also seeing new contaminants being flushed down our waterways into our wastewater treatment facilities that they were never designed for hand, to handle. So remember that it's only 6%, but we have to look beyond phosphorus here. Agriculture is a significant tr contributor with 38% of the load coming from farmland. In addition, there's another key challenge here, and that's the legacy phosphorus that's already bound up in the soils that we keep seeing being flushed down. Developed land, 16%, but it's the big, biggest contributor um, of metric tons per square mile. We're not going to solve this with one policy initiative, and some of the initiatives that we have to advance are going to be challenging, like moving away from single commodity agriculture, so dependent on dairy, and getting farms out of floodplains unless we're, we can't keep contributing that amount of nutrient loading into our lake. Toxics, we thought we had a handle on some of those traditional ones like PCBs and mercury. This slide shows that in 2011 through 2017, mercury levels actually went up. Why? They think that was induced by um, significant events like Tropical Storm Irene. And, sto um, and concerns have been growing about these new generation contaminants, the pesticides, the plastics, the microplastics, um, pharmaceuticals that are everywhere. They flush into our wastewater treatment facilities. The microplastics that wash off from personal care products or come out of synthetic fabrics are too tiny to get screened out in our wastewater treatment facilities. So they go into our waterways and they cause issues there. Uh, we didn't know this when we first started using all these products. It's akin to what happened with the barge canal. Somebody mentioned that that Superfund site in our backyard here. The ex those practices that generated the Superfund site were accepted practices of the day. What are we doing now that are the Superfund sites of, of tomorrow? And we have to plan to make those changes. You know, a lot of the things we're talking about here are everywhere in our society, so those changes to make are going to be really challenging. Um, invasive species, I just want to touch on this briefly. Eric's already mentioned some of it. These are, this is an indication of some of them are, that are coming our way or are already here. Um, but the main vector that we have for these species is the Champlain Canal, the canal that Art Cohen so eloquently noted had such a historical um, value over time. It is, you know, something that we have to address. Main vector, we have got to figure a way around. Otherwise, these species, twice as many in the Hudson River, four times as many in the Great Lakes, they're all coming home here. And nearly finally, I just want to touch on access. Why do we want to talk about access as we move forward into the future? Because people care about things they experience. Eric mentioned earlier about the formative things that made him make choices in his life or how he's going to direct his talents and skills and time to the future. I expect everybody here has had some formative experience with water. That's why you're here today. We have to allow those opportunities for other people. And we have to make sure that people have public access to this public resource. We collectively own it, but not everybody can get to it, and not everybody gets taught how to use it. Not everybody who lives on the shores of Lake Champlain even knows how to swim or basically use a boat. These are just some examples of some of the initiatives, the ecotourism initiatives that are trying to promote um, wise, sustainable use of Lake Champlain and help us move through the water in a more sustainable way. But as Jim, I'm sure, is going to talk about, we also have to make sure that we do that in a way that protects local populations and also doesn't negatively affect um, the lake health. And I just want to touch on one more component, cultural values. What do we care about? What choices do we make as individuals about water? As much as we say as a society, we really value water, we often balk at investing in it. For example, in 2012, the Vermont legislature charged the State Environmental Agency with 
coming up with a report on what it would cost to protect Lake Champlain and restore the state's waterways. And seven years later, we are still trying to pass legislation to pay for it. to try and build a culture of clean water. And I want you to raise your hand if in the last five years you've written a letter to the editor. Raise your hands high, okay? Now keep your hand up or raise your other hand if in the last five years you've contacted your town, your city officials, state or legislative provincial representatives. Anybody do that? Okay. All right. And then how about the governor, the premier, keep your hands up, our congressional delegate, parliamentary representative, the prime minister, or the president. Okay, so raise those hands, okay? All right, great. Now, I want you to keep your hands up if you've ever contacted any of these people about protecting water quality. Okay, so that shows our untapped power as a people. And uh, we've got to we've got to mobilize that power, and the future of the lake will be what we cause it to be. Remember that not only does it reflect these beautiful mountains and the shorelines, it also reflects our values. So hear Odziodzo's words: If we protect the lake, it will also protect us and care for us. Thank you so much. and all of the water. So our two speakers are from the International Joint Commission and we'll begin with Pierre-Yves Coe uh, and then we'll continue with uh, Michael Ladder. Um, they're double teaming this. Cheers. After that talk from Laurie, I am going to have to take off my jacket, <laughs> roll up your sleeves, remove my tie, and roll up my sleeves, right? The future is probably the most daunting thing that we have in front of us. And uh, the talk that I have today with uh, Michael will be uh, on the references that we uh, obtained at the IJC. J'aimerais premièrement remercier Richard and David and Ellen de nous avoir invités ici. C'est bien généreux et nous sommes heureux d'être ici présentés pour la commission. So we have two references, one on water quality and one on flood, flooding. So how did we get here and what does it mean? We've heard that the system's been altered for century. I keep telling, I'm a toxicologist myself in training, I keep telling people that it's those incremental changes that are so pernicious, so insidious, we're not keeping track of the cumulative impacts of those changes. And how do, you, how do you communicate these impacts to the public? Well, we can communicate them by scaring them off, or we can communicate them by talking about the ecosystem services that we've lost. For example, the flooding. With our, we talked, we, we heard that you have 25 or 20 uh, times the land mass than the water. It's important what we do on the land. It's important, the wetlands are important for storage, et cetera, et cetera. There used to be a day where the ecosystem dampened the flooding. Same thing with water quality. There used to be a day where the ecosystem made sure that the waters were clean. Uh, Lori talked to us about climate change, and the only message I'd like to leave here is more often, more extreme. Also in Canada, I'm seeing uh, I can grow things that I couldn't grow before. Is it good? Is it bad? I know it's bad. Some people think it's good. Um, we all know about the uh, impacts on 
our different water uses, drinking water. There's a little town, Bedford, in Quebec, where they have to spend an outrageous amount of money to clean their drinking water every summer just to drink it. Isn't that something that we should be free? Other impacts, uh, recreation. We talked about tourism today. My parents were wed in Venise en Quebec. I'm not sure too many people go to Venise en Quebec anymore to, uh, as a resort. So there are impacts. Some additional challenges that uh, we have, uh, we talk to people, we talk to a lot of people across the watershed and there's a different level of understanding of where the impacts are coming from. This binational context of ours, and it was mentioned this morning, we have five jurisdictions, three levels of government, different languages. So imagine in Quebec, for example, the flooding issue, they have nine departments taking care of the, the flooding issue. We talk to them all. Multiply that by the states and different jurisdictions. Do, do we have, are we actually organized to do concrete actions in this watershed? Perhaps we could take a look at that. The other problem I was just discussing with uh, some very nice folks at lunch, um, the problematic is ingrained in our socioeconomic fabric. We use the land for shelter, we use the land for, for food. Uh, the agriculture is not going away. So what are the, some of the actions, concrete actions, that will help to improve the system for the future generations? Michael? Involvement may not 
have been the best use of, of the IJC for dealing with significant water quality and flooding issues in the basin. Um, in other areas um, along the boundary, uh, to I'm kind of planting the seeds here for some of my folks here in uh, who are involved with the flooding reference. Along the boundary, we established long-standing boards that deal with water quantity or water quality issues. We have yet to see that happen here in this basin. Okay. Okay. So to talk on the flooding reference, I'm not going to linger on this slide. In 2011, we had some dramatic flooding, a dramatic flood event, which actually spurred the governments to give us this reference to look at how to come up with different measures um, to talk to flooding in the basins. I don't know if I'm on time, but here's a graph. <laughs> the point of the graph is our events are getting more frequent, more frequent, and more near, more powerful over time. Um, I don't think I need to spend too much time lingering on this graph, but we're seeing a lot more, <coughs> more events in a shorter period of time, three minutes. And to answer this, the uh, International Joint Commission, in, in uh, collaboration with the governments, have put together a governance structure, which is unique in the fact that we're looking at socio-political and economic impacts of flooding. Now, I'm going to slow down here, and if I run out of time, I'll run out of time. The goal for our flooding uh, reference um, is to either look at reducing high water levels or reducing vulnerability. And you can see we base these up in, in, in themes. Our potential structural solutions that we're looking at, the theme one is to just deal with the increase in flow out of the Richelieu, and the theme, second theme is to actually reduce the inflow to Lake Champlain. And we have measures that we are, we are looking into, is the feasibility of these, of these measures. And beyond structural solutions, we're looking at how do we improve our response to a changing environment or, or increased flooding. Um, better flood responses and better, better flood flooding management. This is really, really difficult when we look at all the multi-jurisdictions we have to deal with, plus the fact we're, we're looking at two nations. Um, we're using GIS. One minute. And again, I'm going to pass this on to your Eve and see if we can get through the water quality in a minute. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I got that brush for a minute. I'll take you time. So the, the water quality, we have uh, two uh, basins, the Champlain Basin and the Memphremagog Basin. Memphremagog is part of the St. Francois River watershed. Um, so the binational approach that we're uh, using, we've gone out to the experts, those are the basin organizations, uh, both LCBP and OBVBM, they are the experts. They live and breathe the, uh, the issue. They do all the research. They know the experts in the basin. They'll be reviewing and evaluating the science and the policy and regulations. They'll be also collecting expert opinions uh, through their networks to see their views. And with that, they'll be developing recommendations that they'll forward to us. We'll look at those recommendations, reassess them, perhaps delete some, add some, and we will provide recommendations to the two federal governments. This work will be peer reviewed, there will be public consultations, and we've set up already advisory groups to help us direct this work. So it's ongoing right now. So what are we facing? The problem we saw today took us decades to get here. There were signs. And it'll probably take us decades to get out of it. So the, the, the question with, uh, let's put some chemicals in there to, to trap the, the chemicals, it's not really feasible. The technology just isn't quite there yet for us to, to uh, remove the phosphorus in such a big lake. So there is a current opportunity, and that's to take stock and reinforce what governments jurisdictions, different organizations have been doing well. Let's reinforce that. But then there's also an opportunity to recommend an approach 
towards remediation. And it will probably be a longer term approach, an approach that probably spans several decades, goes through successive political administrations, and gets resourced by these because it's the right thing to do.
We have five offices throughout the Adirondacks, but our central office in Lake Placid, and we have an office actually at the Crown Point Bridge Building on Lake Champlain. And you know, we certainly uh, we do eight destination websites under an Adirondacks USA brand. And you know, we do have a Lake Champlain region site and social media that that we do quite a bit. We have uh, 12 government contracts in the Adirondacks, counties, towns, and villages. Uh, we're funded primarily by occupancy taxes, so, you know, we have to do show some success so we can get the funding going. And, you know, that's led us to understand the challenges in the Adirondacks are somewhat similar but somewhat different. Yeah, you know, I know everybody knows the view of the Adirondacks, but I'm not sure everybody really knows what the Adirondacks are really about. It's the largest publicly protected land area in the continental U.S. If you take Yellowstone, Yosemite's, Grand Canyon, and Smoky Mountain National Parks, combine them, they're not as large as the Adirondack Park. It's a mixture of public and private land. About 2.6 million acres are owned by New York State, plus they manage another 785,000 acres in conservation easements, which leaves about 2.6 million acres of land in total public or private holdings. But that land, both public and private land, is re regulated by the Adirondack Park Agency. And if you ride through the Adirondacks, you'll notice that there's hamlets, and that's where the development can happen. And it's not between the, between the hamlets, very limited development. So it's a little unique. It's 2,300 lakes and ponds, 31,000 miles of rivers and streams, over 46 high peaks. And you know, there's a lot of Vermonters over there, because I ride by that Route 73, and you know, there's <laughs> Connecticut license plate from my license plate actually are usually at the highest level, so I don't know about that. But Vermont and the Adirondacks have a lot in common. How many acres in the state of Vermont? Six million. 6.154 to be exact. <laughs> I rounded that. How many acres in the Adirondacks? Six million. 6.1 million. <laughs> I rounded down again. I know. So uh, the Adirondacks and the state of Vermont are about the same size. We share Lake Champlain, which we all know we've talked about today is a real jewel. Mountains, forests, lakes, rivers, tourism and forestry, outdoor recreation on a year-round basis, resort destinations, a day drive to over 60 million people, quality of life. Um, Wendy mentioned earlier, I'm not sure here, if the state of Vermont does about 2.8 million, a billion in tourism. At around that's still about 2 billion uh, on an annual basis. Same products, same theater markets. Well, we have some differences too. How many tappable sugar maples in the state of Vermont? Who knows? I know. Six million? No. Well, there was a study done about 10 years ago by Cornell University, Mike Farrell, who got his PhD, and he's actually operating a pretty heavy duty maple facility in Montpelier right now. Part of his PhD was determining that the state of Vermont versus the Adirondacks. Well, the state of Vermont well-known in the maple sugar industry, has 110 million tappable maples. How many in the Adirondacks? No. <laughs> 130 million. Ooh. However, about 50% of those are on the state forest preserve land and can't be touched, so you're in luck. You can still carry that, so. But, but that's just something to, to know. You know, the, um, once the state owns the land in the Adirondacks, they've been continuing to buy it. That park started in 1892, one of the oldest in the country. The land has to be kept forever wild in forest lands. You can't lease, sell, or exchange it, nor can the timber be sold, removed, or destroyed. And it's part of the New York State Constitution. So it's pretty significant in land management. Number of Alpine ski resorts in Vermont. 20. Number in the Adirondacks? Two large ones and two small ones. <laughs> so, you know, the two large ones are state owned and combined have less skier visits than Stowe or Killington. So, just give you an idea there. Lake Champlain, that's where we have a lot of similarities. Uh, in Vermont, five rivers and three creeks feed, feed the lake. In New York, eight rivers and one creek. 
So, you know, pretty soon, we're producing milks, and we're feeding it the same way. You know, it provides drinking water for us, 81 species of fish. I don't know if that's still current with climate change going on. That number is certainly subject to change. Over 300 bird species. It's played such a vital role in U.S. history. That lake is pretty phenomenal. I don't know if you all go down to Fort Ticonderoga. Recreation was mentioned, swimming, boating. We're connected pretty easily. We've got two bridges. We've got two year-round ferries. Got two seasonal ferries, and we can certainly drive around. So we're we're well connected, um, and I think that's really my point: is that you know we have to work not as Vermont and New York for the basin. We have to work for the basin, and, and we have to get rid of those boundary lines of the state. I think to be effective for the future. I mean, just look at the attendance here today is a great example of how we have to do that. And we do have some opportunities, I think, even though that we're at a time in, in, in evolution here where we know the human influence has had effect. But, you know, I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but uh, who's not familiar with the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Reserve? Anybody not know about that? Good. Well, that was created back in 18, 18, 1989. And, you know, what that is, there's a number of biosphere reserves around the world. I think there's 40, there's 400? There what? 40. Okay, we're going to get going. Well, anyway, we're going to talk about that at the end. Uh, its goals are to encourage social and economic vitality while preserving and improving the environmental health of the, of, the, of the reserve. We're fortunate that we have the Basin Program and the Lake Champlain Committee doing a lot of the work of that. But some of the challenges we have is clearly climate change, that's been mentioned, I don't have to get into that. Uh, recreation is even going to be affected, it's going to be warmer, wetter, and wilder uh, out there. The fisheries will certainly be affected. You know, pollution and ag runoff, we've mentioned that. Drinking water, recreation, swimming, all that was mentioned today. But with the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Reserve, that's an international designation. That gives us the ability to work with sustainable and ecotourism on a worldwide basis and use that as a tool to enhance what we want to accomplish here. There's also the Champlain Hudson Power, Power Express. Everybody familiar with that? Probably I don't know how everybody feels about that, but that's going to have, once that gets in the flake, it's going to have a fund of $117 million that, that is going to be used over 30 plus years. And that is to help the you know, aquatic quality of Lake Champlain. Uh, Hudson River and some other ones. That's a power line that originated in Canada, go underwater down Lake Champlain into New York City, clean energy, so there's a lot of plus there. Environmental leadership for the future is very important. A couple of great examples. Mirror Lake, which is a little lake on Lake Placid, it's got a salt problem. So what does the government do? Push down more salt. So it's affecting the water's ability to turn over, affecting the lake trout, that's got to be managed. This morning over on Vermont Public Radio, anybody here uh, VPR this morning and heard about Addison County and the farm and the and everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two minutes, I got two minutes. Why is that happening now? That's things we have to have to get engaged with. Um, so sustainable tourism, you do tourism for the benefit of residents, not the benefit of travelers. One quick example of what's going on in Essex County is the development through occupancy tax of what's going to be called the Community Tourism Enhancement Fund. That's going to be $2 million on an annual basis to go into programs to help the community and help tourism. Things like that salt issue I, I mentioned, invasives. There's, uh, there's ways to go to use tourism for the benefit of, of it. Um, finally, I have a lot more things, but Wendy's, are you still here? Let's co-op, let's get some money together, you, me, and Canada, we're gonna do something around the lake. Not only cycling, we can do beer, uh, brew pubs, we can Woo! do farms, yeah. we can do dining around the lake, historic sites. And yeah. rent your house for the solar eclipse. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, that was an excellent panel, and I will open it wide open to questions to any of the speakers. Hands up there, microphones going around, yes. Great. You can say your name. I was Bruce Post two hours ago, and I still am. Um, just one quick thing. I don't know if Art's still here. I gave him a cartoon 
that political cartoon that came from the uh, Suburban List, which was a weekly in Essex Junction in the 60s and the 70s. The cartoon was done by a cartoonist, an artist named Jane Clark Brown. It showed a birch bark canoe, ghost-like. In it was Samuel de Champlain and maybe two or three uh, native peoples. There were tires floating by, uh, smelling fumes coming off the water, uh, dead fish, and Champlain's comment was, Sacre bleu, what are they doing to my lake? That's a half century ago. And we're still saying, Sacre bleu, what are they doing to the lake? And that's rather dispiriting, uh, this commentary. Regarding the Adirondacks, um, we celebrate George Perkins Marsh, who wrote Man and Nature in 1864 or so. Uh, we have a little park dedicated to him in, in uh, Woodstock. And yet, uh, he was a prophet without honor in his land. Uh, but across the lake, Phil Terry, who wrote the book on contested terrain about the creation of the Adirondack Park, uh, said that those New York leaders of that time learn from George Perkins Marsh. So the problem I think we have here in Vermont, we haven't learned. We really haven't learned that lesson. Despite our claims to environmental purity, uh, we're dealing with issues and we're not solving them. So I think we need to get beyond the marketing, and as you were doing, rolling up your sleeve and loosening your tie and really naming the problem and then dealing with it. And uh, yes, you've got problems too in the Adirondacks, but thank God for the Forest Preserve, or else your TMDL level would be a lot higher than it is today. So thanks. Any responses from the group? Um, that works in the Adirondack works in the Six million. <laughs> Maybe to, to spark the discussion. Maybe to spark the discussion. Okay. Maybe to spark discussion. Um, Eric, we, we were talking just a little bit earlier about uh, the uh, HAPS. And with everything that we've seen today, is it something that, like climate change, uh, and people were mentioning it. We, in essence, lost the battle, in that we need to adapt to it. I, I am. I think the people that will be doing something to reduce climate change. This is. It's. Uh, it's. Uh, it's fortuitous. It's uh, something very good. However, I think it's now we need to talk about adaptation, because our kids. Your kids will see out the blues over the long haul. So maybe we need to talk about how to adapt to uh, these haps and these beach closures, etc. Any comments? I can probably speak loud enough. I'm sorry, hold on one second. I'm sorry, so I said go on. That's okay. I didn't know if I was next. Um, hi, I'm Susan uh, McClure. I'm the director of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. So we at the museum look at the relationship between the land and the people and the water. And one of the people things that has come up today is agricultural runoff and phosphorus in the lake. So I, I guess I have a question and a request for discussions like this. And the first question for the panel is, what will the future look like in working with the agricultural community and what are some examples of um, programs or ideas that are starting to get going now that you think are heading in the right direction? And the request would be for us to include the voices of farmers and agricultural sector workers in conversations around this. There's a lot of people who are thinking about this in the agriculture world and often the world, our worlds are segregated in that way. So I think these conversations can be a great opportunity to bring them all together.
Only one at a time, I think it's the electronic rule. Thank you. Don't press the button. To that comment, we talked about um, we're going to be interviewing, at least like the uh, basin organizations will be interviewing the experts. They'll be getting their opinions. Career people that have uh, spent their careers thinking about the problems. What would you do to solve the issue? And these people are telling us, I, I, I think about Aubert Michaud, who's telling me, oh, I've got the solution for you. And he starts laying it out for you on, on the pipe watershed. This is what I would do. And, He's got it in his head, so we need to, to capture those thoughts. But then you think, well, are they ideal, too idealistic? Or can we, together, if five jurisdictions, three levels of governments, uh, can we make it happen? These people are giving you the solutions, so it's incumbent on all of us to make them happen, make it happen. So yes, there's some possibilities out there, but there's got to be a will. I'll build on what Pierre Yuko said. Uh, <laughs> is, is, is the mere fact that the state of Vermont has done, I believe, its due diligence with regards to to dealing with agricultural practices through the new TMDL process, and that's something um, I don't know. What the province of Quebec is not so much New York, but we don't have the loading issues in Europe. But that's something that's being looked at, and it's a step in the right direction. You know, how do we how do we make these, uh, let's say, the TMDL enterprise something that's international, that we can look at the system as a whole. So I think um, the, the new norm now is actually, again, as I was speaking before, an integration of, of, of communication and collaboration up and down the multi-jurisdictional scale, including municipalities and townships, uh, to address that. It all does come down to, you know, how do we affect human behavior. <coughs> um, and so that's where I'll advance and pass it over. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Susan, for that question and comment. And, and I think you know, the issue with agriculture in this watershed is a complicated one and for many factors. And one is that for years, farmers were told to import phosphorus and, and to apply it on their lands by a higher than ergonomic rate. You also have a, a, a group that, particularly when, when you're talking about dairy in particular, they produce a product where they don't set the price. And so for most of us, we can budget for that, for, for what are they going to be the costs that we have to take on. Farmers are in a situation where those price supports are, are set nationally. They don't really make sense. But that is the system that we have gotten, and I've worked on policy issues for many years. When they talk about farm bill reform, there is nothing that I've ever seen close to farm bill reform until you start talking about those kind of price supports. But we are in a smaller region where we can think more creatively, and we're going to have to do that, and very importantly, certainly bring farmers into the conversation. Those conversations are going on. But we also have a bias, particularly in this state, and that is, I have heard this stated, and this is a gross overgeneralization, but that in Vermont, agriculture is dairy. That cannot be our mantra. And we have to think about ways to transition, in some cases, to a system that is, and I'm not saying we lose all our dairy farms, but we have to confront this issue and we also have to look at ways that we can be more diversified with agriculture, not so dependent on outside markets, but we also have to re understand our own agency in that. We all buy food. I know a lot of people who buy, um, you know, won't buy organic milk. They have that high value for it. They have the economic opportunity and ability to do that but they're going to go for a cheaper product. 
So when we talk about this future and we really think what our values are, we don't want our farms going out of business because those slides that we all showed earlier show a much greater nutrient loading per acre from developed land. It's not the answer to lose that, but we do have to have a much more benign model out there. And we have to think about those importation rates of phosphorus, how much we're applying on the land, how much gets absorbed. And there are places where we can no longer farm. And I know that is an unpopular thing to say, but in certain places, we, you know, unless we can be good stewards of both the land and the water, we cannot do that. But we are going to have to help a community that has been so instrumental to defining this place, our quality of life, and also our working landscape, in transitioning there too. I have a question uh, to the Binational Commission. Um, it was set up in the early 1900s. It took both federal governments. Um, and there is any number of well-managed reports, um, carefully considered, public comment, lots of scientific input, that then get shelved. Um, what is the roadmap as you see it um, on how we all can get the results of, for example, the scientific um, reports and best evidence um, implemented, worked on? Um, it does not seem like the state of Vermont alone can do it, not the state of New York, not the province of Quebec. I, I think it's going to take um, some higher level between the two governments to push this through because when you're telling um, and when you're selling an economic plan to, gee, you just can't find them anymore. Um, <laughs> that's not going to work unless there are subsidies or something and that will come from governments and it's not just state government, it's going to be a federal thing. So, um, without monopolizing time, uh, as members of the Binational Commission, do you have any thoughts as to what is the next step when you finally compile your report? That's an excellent question and you spoke exactly to the point I was trying to make during, the, during our talk there. At the IJC, we can only make recommendations to the government, it's governments and it's up to the governments to do what they will with the recommendations. And a lot of the times you are correct, these recommendations do sit on the desk or get shelved. Now the real, that leaves the question, uh, why do we have an International Joint Commission, right? So it all, it all comes down to how can the International Joint Commission and the recommendations affect the mandates of those organizations and bureaus that are charged with working or, or controlling our natural resources. So how do we, how can the, uh, our findings with regards to nutrient loading in, uh, in, in Lake Champlain, how do we get um, NRCS folks um, who are on the county level speaking with their equivalents in Canada? You know, because there's definitely, there's not only a border, a political border, but there's also jurisdictional or, or I call it mandate borders uh, that, that happen. And in order to get, some of our recommendations to, uh, to, uh, with, uh, to work, we have to focus on those organizations upon whom we, we depend on for information. We have to make sure that, that ECCC is, is working, working with USGS and USGS's many uh, silos. We have to make sure that the, the provincial agencies are working in sync with the different state agencies because there's not really a uh, what's well, changing slowly, but there's really not a, a, a neutral platform upon which these agencies can co can collaborate and actually make uh, some of these some of these recommendations work. You know, am I making making sense here? So I think the ultimate goal of the, uh, of the IJC is to affect different mandates so some of these recommendations can be taken seriously. And I and I. I'm the last half full kind of guy. I really think that the outcome of our, our quality study from Megog and 
And Mr. Koi Bay is going to shine a light on um, a, a nice light on Vermont, to be honest with you, but it's going to shine a light on if we're going to clean up this lake, we're going to have to have uh, some very well scripted and well defined collaborations to make that work. In other places, we haven't been so lucky. Um, one of the things that was shown is uh, the IJC was in this basin several times during since 1936 when they built they 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 basically reviewed the system and Friars Dam was built. The system was going to be controlled at that time. Never happened. The war came came along. Then we studied, studied the system time and time again. Those engineers back then in the 70s were excellent. The, the measures that they proposed were top-notch uh, measures. However, they didn't take the pulse, the social uh, acceptability, and the appetite from these different stakeholders to those measures. And that's what's different today. So they're going out there, uh, finding out what that appetite is so that when they do come up with recommendations there's some perhaps there's going to, it's going to be implemented minister uh minister bouchard one of our uh previous ministers he said to us you need to go through the process right now you've got an opportunity you've got an independent organization who's going to take stock of the issue it's not biased, it's going to show government, this is an independent review of the situation. And here are proposed recommendations for both solving the flooding issue and looking at addressing over the long haul the water quality issue. Pay attention. We won't be here uh, for another 20, 30 years. So it's important to take, as Minister said, go through the process. If you want to get funding for that, you've got you've got a document to support a Treasury Board submission to go get the resources to implement those uh, those measures. Take your time, go through the process. So I'll build on what Perry uh, was talking about and just stress on the point that one of the goals or one of the uh, well, well the goal of the IJC, especially in this region is to make sure that the recommendations that we make with regards to water quality or even our flooding um, outlive different political cycles. Um, Pierre, you will be bringing that up often, and I think you're spot on. Um, and I think in the future, I mean, that is that is definitely a challenge, is how do we make, we make great recommendations that uh, we take into account different people's opinions and views, we engage stakeholders, yet how do we get the government, how do we get to, people actually to do these things and how do we make our, our recommendations viable vis-a-vis -vis through different political cycles. So, uh, yes. so Laura, you mentioned earlier uh, a big part of this issue is water retention along the, the basin and uh, I was just wondering, you, uh, Piri, you mentioned um, did I say that right? Um, remediation and how that plays a role into more innovative um, practices um, is how are we going to make our soil more spongy and retain that water and some innovative practices with remediation. I'd just like to hear more on that. It's not only one thing to remediate. I think somebody was talking about land use. Uh, stop growing corn in those uh, areas that um, that leach are vulnerable to leaching to the lake, and have the policies in place to replace corn to something of greenhouses. So subsidies. We need we need to change that socioeconomic fabric because the low hanging fruits are gone. So we need to take dr almost drastic measures if we really want to solve the issue because with climate change temperatures are rising it's only going to get worse uh, Landon Dennison, Hinesburg, Vermont. 
Um, I just uh, have a, a comment and a question. Uh, the, the comment is, uh, whose lake is it? And, uh, you know, when I had a, had a boat, uh, I, it was my lake. And as soon as I uh, went home and sold my boat and went home uh, eight miles uh, inland, um, Lake Champlain was no longer mine because I didn't have any ac access to it. So, um, how many people in Vermont, New York, and Quebec really think of it as their lake if they live away from the lake? So I, I, I think that it's, uh, it's important for all of us to uh, think about uh, the Lake Champlain watershed as part of our lake. And that makes a lot more people responsible for it than just those who live along the, uh, along the water side. Here, and, here. <laughs> and someone said to me uh, over the lunch hour is that um, the access to the lake is really very poor. The, there are fishing accesses, but someone who has a canoe paddle technically can't use that access. Um, so if there are a lot of fishermen out there, uh, a paddler can't put his canoe in, in the lake from there. So you have to think about access. New York State, you know, just geologically, has very poor access to the lake. But anyway, so I, I, I think it's important to tell somebody in Berlin, uh, Vermont, is it Berlin or Berlin? I've forgotten which state has which. But anyway, uh, that it's their lake as well as mine. Um, then I had a question for the IJC. Um, who controls the lake? How is it controlled? Is there a, is there a person standing with at a wheel uh, controlling the level every day? That's a, that's a really good question. Remember when I was talking about how the IJC is actionable on landscape through a reference and through an order of approval. Or, orders of approval are when we have actually something to turn on and turn off. Like, let's say, Lake Ontario, the Upper Great Lakes, Rainy River, Lake in the Woods. We actually have a structure, Lake of Soyuz. We don't have anybody here in this basin turning on or turning off a switch for, 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 to regulate uh, water levels and flows. So one of the, one of the unique uh, aspects of, of this study that we're trying to, that we were, that we're going to do and we're in the middle of doing is we're exploring what would be the impact of, of, uh, of basin storage. Uh, what different land, land use land uses and land use practices can be changed to decrease the amount of runoff coming, coming into the lake. So the direct answer to your question is there is nobody um, turning on or turning off anything to regulate flows in this lake. They tried uh, in the 30s with the building of the Friars Dam, uh, which remained un, unfinished because of World War II. And there is marginal control, I'm gonna say marginal, very little control, with regards to the, the widening of the Chambly Canal up in St. John. Uh, but, but that's not anybody having a direct uh, on-off switch with regards to flows, levels of flows. I have one more question. Where yes. does the lake end? That's an excellent, that's another, another good question. Get that man's number. So, I mean, through this, during, I, as a, as a Hydrologist ge um, geographer here, I've noticed four different versions of, of what the Lake Champlain Basin is. Now, from the international or binational, um, the the basin itself starts in the southernmost, I think it's Port Henry, and goes all the way up to Sorel. It's almost like a siphon. We're entering, we're, en we're emptying this huge swimming pool through the straw of the Richelieu River, and so. The folks up in um, um, in Quebec who live in Sorel, they actually live in the basin. But it's a, a it's a product of our different uh, I don't say expectations, but our different uh, imaginations of what this basin is that we see different maps. But from a hydrologic standpoint, from Henry to Sorel. I just want to quickly follow up on your point about who owns the lake. I think it's not here. Uh, um, thank you. 
Um, your point about who owns the lake, just to reinforce a point, we all do. This lake is held in public ownership, okay? So we all have a role in its future. And thank you for sharing that when you moved away, you know, just eight miles, it was less important. That's uh, unfortunately a value. And it's a reality that our organization deals with routinely. We're part of what we try and do is expand people's definition of their backyard. So that includes not just that bay of use or their, you know, their access point, but that they care about the Sisquoi Bay and the South Lake and other parts of the watershed um, that they influence. I mean, how many of you use the lake today? Today, today. Raise your hands high if you used it today. Okay. Did you go to the bathroom? Did you drink water here? You all use the lake. And that's one of the things that we have to remember here, uh, you know, and, and, you know, as much as we value water and could not survive, there is no business, there is none of, none of us could survive without water. We talk about it so rarely. And, you know, there are people here and institutions here, like, you know, Brian Costello is here at Local Motion, you can wave your hand, who runs the, the ferry along the causeway, getting people access. Barry um, Lamke, who just helped orchestrate a great conference last Friday at ECHO about the culture of the lake and, and its future. The Maritime Museum that's highlighting those underwater preserves, Champlain Area Trails in the, in the Adirondacks, trying to connect people to place through a connection of water trails. Our own organization oversees over 40 sites on Lake Champlain for the Lake Champlain Paddlers Trail. We are all working together to raise our voices and to link arms with people like you to talk about water more often. But we need all of you. If we really want to see a change in this lake, these are the easy places to talk about water. But unfortunately, the conversation doesn't continue outside of here. And it's incumbent on all of us. If we want to bend the curve, that's what we've got to do. And we desperately need you to carry that water outside this room. So thank you. So, and really, the disconnection sometimes from the further away from the lake, the, the less connected. That's the reason to really look at the Champlain Adirondack Biosphere Reserve because that not only includes the lake, it includes the Green Mountains and the Adirondacks and it's greater and it's a global significance. So I think that that gives reason to investigate and move forward that further. And, and very importantly, the Biosphere Reserve had a very strong connection to this being a populated place. And in fact, that so. was one thing that was unique about that reserve when it was established at that time, and it's sort of, it's this covenant that we've sort of overlooked, but I think it has a lot of opportunity in the future. Yeah, the biggest challenge with that is that it's overlooked, and it's the largest biofear reserve in the States, and it's the fourth largest in the world. I'll uh, just very briefly mention, I'd like to shout out, um, this question about access to the lake and moving away from it, I'd like to give a shout out to Sea Grant and the Watershed Alliance because they bring in um, students from schools throughout the Vermont watershed, but particularly underserved schools, underfunded schools, that might not have other access to the lake. Um, we, thanks to donors, this is at the University of Vermont, thanks to donors who are putting together an endowment for our research vessel, which is also used for teaching, um, we're going to be more and more able to take those school groups at a very, very discounted rate to perhaps almost free rate, and take those students, the kids, you know, from K through 12, out on Lake Champlain so they can see this resource. And that's where it begins, right? The kids come home to their parents and go, wow, dad, mom, did you see that? This is amazing. And that's literally your grassroots bringing it up from below. So yay, Sea Grant and Watershed Lions, and thanks to our donors who are bringing that endowment to bear. Um, we can get them out there. And local motion, thank you. I've, I've worked with Brian on that ferry. It's amazing how many people go, I've never been in a boat before. <laughs> wow. OK, that's an awesome experience. That's another exposure to the world. I think we have time for one last question, probably. And we're, the Governor Scott, I think, is here or here soon. So we have somebody with a mic, you said? Please. I'll, I'll be very brief. Thank, thank you. Me. I'm Mary O'Neill. I'm a planner here with the city of Burlington. But I happen to live along the Georgia shore, and there's a great big caveat that goes, uh, Lori, with the, tab, with the, uh, the uh, particular 
piece of information you gave. I let it go this morning. I thought nobody's going to know except who lives on the Georgia shore. But there was, in fact, a $1.8 million diminution in our tax rolls in the town of Georgia in 2015. The large caveat here is this was a property owner requested. There was an opportunity that the previous summer, the month of August, was terrible in the St. Albans Bay. And investment property owners that had rental properties and summer camp owners were very distressed that a third of their summer swimming was cut short. They are the ones that caused the conversation to move forward. And the town of Georgia offered a blanket $50,000 reduction in your tax assessment. There was no analysis per property. There's been no follow-up of sales, which would be very important to understand because those people that happily had their tax bills reduced did not expect they were going to sell their properties for those low prices. They thought they were going to sell their properties for what they are. So unless there's a lister here from the Missisquoi Bay or St. Albans Bay, I'm happy to tell you that property values for fair market are not diminished, but the tax rates, the tax bills for those 37 homeowners who volunteered to have their property diminished. Um, that's the reason for the 1.8. Also, the town of Georgia reassessed the rest of us, which made our tax bills level out the, uh, the income that they had that year. So it, there's, there's context to that statement, and there is absolutely no analysis that led to the diminution of the property values. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm Cree Little Act from Shelburne. Um, and my question really is for you, Lori. Uh, I want to thank the panel for a great discussion. Um, it is about uh, resilience issues in the face of flooding and water quality. Uh, and it's about the wetland rules that are being discussed in the Vermont legislature, in the House uh, and Senate Agriculture Committees. And um, I'm wondering if you can just to talk a little bit about wetlands rules and agriculture and agricultural exemptions from those wetland rules and what that might mean for wetland protection and restoration. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that succinctly, but um, thank you, Cree, for raising that. Um, there's a, a proposal in the legislature now, which is really an incredible step backwards to um, really weaken our wetlands rules in order to um, in, in, um, to uh, avoid, I think, any repercussions for agriculture. And I, I can't go into all the details now. I have to check my phone with our water protection advocate for latest um, updates on that. But I think one of the larger issues here and one of the, the big concerns is that for many years I think because we so how you know we identify with agriculture um, very strongly and it's understandable and I want to be adamant that I am not anti-agriculture but I do see that we are at a very critical stage where we have to find a better way forward and I think as a region we really have to envision a proper, a, 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 you know, a different approach. And to bring, you know, and farmers very much have to be in part, as part of that conversation and in those discussions. But we absolutely cannot go backwards in terms of weakening what are really fundamental protections. Lake Champlain, in terms of any environmental issue you look at, our wetlands have been absolutely critical to environmental mitigation. And there are some of us through the IJC process in terms of looking at that flooding issue that are really um, trying to advance natural systems as important tools in better protecting not only our ecosystem, but also our, our even populations. And there are many stories we can tell about that. And even through Tropical Storm Irene, the strong wetland systems help places avoid extensive flooding. So we don't want to go backwards. But I think, and this is again a gross overgeneralization, but for many years, agriculture 
particularly the Vermont legislature, there were ongoing agricultural exemptions. It was just it was just par for the course when you were advancing legislation. We cannot do that any longer. Um, recently, the legislation that passed um, several years ago in terms of what's called the Clean Water Act really required much more stringent controls on agriculture. We need to really be enforcing those, and there's no way that we should be weakening things that are really fundamental to environmental protection. So, you know, stay involved. Um, you can contact me for more detailed information on what's going on there, but, uh, you know, just want to make that larger point that we need to really not only protect our farming community, but we also pr need to protect the land and the water that um, we're so dependent on. I'd like to uh, thank Ellen and this absolutely stellar panel for a terrific <laughs>
It'll show you when it's hurt. It'll show you when it's ailing. But we need to be good stewards of the land. Thank you. Scott is the 82nd governor of Vermont, and uh, far more important, he's a graduate of the University of Vermont, <laughs> class of 1980. Phil Scott. Well, thank you very much. I know it's been a long day for each and every one of you, but uh, important work today, and uh, it's something that we have to continue to talk about. I think the good news is, uh, throughout uh, uh, the state and throughout the legislature and the administration, we all have the same goal. We all know that we have to clean up our lake. It's the crown jewel of Vermont, and it's something that we have to protect. Um, so the good news is we are all on board and try, trying to uh, move forward. Um, my administration, we've come forward with, with the funding uh, we believe uh, necessary this year and ongoing uh, throughout the next uh, decade or two to continue this process. So that's the good news. Uh, we may have different roadmaps on how to get there, uh, but again, I try to focus on common goals, what we can do together. When I took office a couple of years ago, I had talked about uh, my three guiding principles, to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, protect the most vulnerable. Lake Champlain and our waterways uh, are an integral in at least two out of the three, maybe all three. When you think about growing the economy, it's incredibly important to us. It's an asset to us here, the Lake Champlain is, uh, to our region, to our state. But also, it's amongst the most vulnerable. And again, we have, to, we have an obligation to protect that. So as we look to, to do both, protect the most vulnerable, grow this economy, uh, again, it goes hand in hand. It's not either or, it's both. And I think that uh, we have, uh, again, a lot to look forward to. I know uh, each and every one of you and the panelists here today uh, have a piece of that. Uh, so uh, from my perspective, um, we, uh, I'm going to look at the, at the glass as half full, uh, and, uh, and it's getting clearer, uh, although slowly. Um, but, uh, but again, uh, that's what we have to look forward again to. Because when you look at uh, some of the studies that have been done, we know as the quality and the clarity of the water decreases, uh, our economic uh, opportunity decreases as well. So the clearer the water gets, the more economic advantage it is for us as a state. So regardless of what side of the, the issue you're on, uh, we're in this uh, hand in hand, and, uh, and I believe that we, uh, we can get this uh, accomplished because, again, we share the same goal. I thank you so much uh, for taking part in this your ongoing effort. Uh, this isn't, uh, this is going to take some time, uh, but again, working together, pulling the same direction is how we'll accomplish this. So thanks again for having me and thanks for taking the time today to do this. Richard, my partner, partner in crime, come, up, come on up here. You've got some directions here for next steps? The only logistical thing I have to add here at the end is if anybody needs a ride down to the flag raising ceremony, let me know. We decided to save emissions and not rent a giant bus. <laughs> but if anybody does need a ride, let me know and I'll be happy to arrange that. I have a couple of, of um, cars here ready to do that. Um, the only other logistic thing is you may have noticed we have been taping and doing all sorts of media related stuff and we will work with all the folks here and make that available at some point soon. And there's some really great interviews that I think we've been able to do. And um, it's been a you know, pleasure trying to work on this and organize this. We've been so lucky to have such great panelists from all sorts of places. And of course, David probably has some last thing to say here. Absolutely nothing to say. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>